Hello, I'm Lane Hartzell with the Korea Industry and Technology Times. I'm here with eco philosopher Derek Jensen, who is a prolific writer, activist, and also a, a teacher of mine. Welcome, uh, Derek. Oh, it's it's always great to talk with you. Uh, today, we're going to discuss rivers. Um, Derek has written a lot about rivers, about uh, in fact, almost takes an animistic uh, approach to nature at times, almost some shamanistic kind of ideas I, I see. And aside from the analytic uh, um, integrity that you maintain with the, such as uh, uh, bright green lies and this kinds of work. So the the ability that Derek has is, is impressive. And um, the, the, his particular coverage of rivers caught my attention Um with the essay that he's going to talk about today and also with some others that um, some references that I looked up. So I'd like to get into this, maybe approach it a little bit more poetically and that rather than analytically, although there are some issues such as the Colorado River. Uh, first, can you talk about your essay on rivers and your your ideas? Well, I think before we get to the to the piece that was called Pretend Your River, before we get to that, I, I think one of the things I would like to say is, is I think we generally almost completely misdefine rivers. I'm not saying mystify, I'm saying misdefine. And what I mean by that, we probably mystify them too. But anyway, what I mean by that is that we think about a river as basically a channel through which water flows. So it's like a pipe, it's a, it's a trough, it's a, it's a tube in which there's water. And that's not really how a river works. First, it's not really what a river is. First, a river doesn't flow through a channel. It writhes across the landscape like a snake. It moves back and forth. Before we turned on the recorder, we were talking about a map that uh, was of the Mississippi River and all the various channels, or channels is the wrong word, all the various ways or places that the Mississippi River had, had flowed before. And it is this beautiful uh, movement. It's here this year, next year it's over here, next year it's over here. And all of those are different parts of the river. And so again, first off, a river is not static. It doesn't, until they channelize it to use it for transportation, commerce, and flood control, rivers move all over. And um, I mean, the big rivers of your part of the world do that too. The big rivers of every part of the world do that. Um, exceptions may be like the Colorado River at the end is pretty, or not in the end, but through the Grand Canyon is, is very channelized. But it's it also it varies in in uh, the flow. You know, at sometimes it's very small and sometimes it's huge, and so they're they're dynamic. Um, again, moving across the landscape. Another way we must define them is by presuming that they end at the bank, but they don't. They reach deep into the soil and they reach far beyond their banks. And they also uh, reach into the air. They create their own weather. I mean, we've all been by a river and seen mist coming off the river. That is part of the river too. And underneath where the water is flowing fast, there'll be mud and then more mud. And then there'll be under underground, there's water flowing as well. And that's all part of the river. And another part of the river, I don't know if you've been to places where you see a large flat valley and then you have mountains coming up and the river sort of meanders through the valley. That whole area is really part of the river. That whole area is part of the larger river community. So that's really the, the first couple ways that we misdefine rivers is by A, presuming they're static and B, presuming that they are, that they end at the banks. Um, and this is true in so many different ways. Oh, and another way we misdefine rivers, at least in the Northern hemisphere, 
is that um, this isn't quite so much rivers, but it is certainly as streams. Oh, well, I'm going to back up a second and, and say that another way we misdefine rivers is we think about them just as, as again, channels through which people can, can take ships, take barges. But I read a history of the Mississippi River from, I don't know, 18, from, from let's say 1700 through, through, I think it was about 1900 or 1880, a couple years ago. And one of the things that really changed the Mississippi was when they took out all of the old snags. And snag is a word for dead trees, really. And so it would be these huge old trees under the water that are that are hazards to shipping. But another word for those snags is habitat. And they would make incredibly rich habitat for anybody. I mean, all the fish, all the all the other creatures who live there. And there were some rivers that would get log jams that would be so large then and they would last for so long that they would grow forests of their own. So mm -hmm. you get a big log jam forms. There's a log jam on the Red River in the United States that uh, was about at one point about 100 miles long. And uh, it had to be blasted out with dynamite. It didn't have to be blasted out. They did blast it out with dynamite. But those places, some of them would have log jams so old that trees start growing up out of the log jam. And then down below, they reach into the water. And of course, the water is very rich. I mean, it's basically hydroponics, you know, in, in a sense. And it's incredibly rich habitat for fish. And so that's another way that we misdefine them as we think that they are, again, it's just a channel through which water flows and not all of these various and very different habitats can form. And then when, when I wanted to bring up streams too, that I've been, been talking to this guy, Jacob Shockey, who's just great. He's a beaver expert and beaver advocate and he talks about how he doesn't really like the word stream because you know you talk about water streaming you know if you spill if you spill water it streams off your counter but water is not supposed to stream through a stream in the northern hemisphere and that's because of beavers that when you see this this wide area for a river the river might flow back and forth through that whole larger plain but for a stream, it didn't, it sort of flowed back and forth. But what really happened is the entire area was turned into a giant war, uh, marshland by beavers. And the water isn't streaming through it. It's not in one channel, but instead it's a whole series of these incredibly bi biodiverse ponds. Um, and I don't know what the same, what would lead to the same ecological conditions in the Southern hemisphere or even near the equator in the Northern hemisphere. But I know in, in Europe, Northern Asia, and North America, beavers were everywhere. And they were the primary, I don't really like this word, but the primary engineers of the whole river system. Again, I, I'm very uncomfortable with that word. Um, anyway, another, another way, but another part I want to bring up, I was going to say this to the end of the interview, but, but I, I love it. And I want to make sure we get it in is that Years ago, I was talking to a uh, a fisheries biologist about a river she loves up in the Olympic Peninsula, again in the United States. It's um, the river is undammed, and she said it floods, you know, every year. And every time it floods, she said it breaks her heart because because it floods kill a lot of beings. Um, it kills trees, you know, it uproots trees, kills trees. It kills the fish who get stuck over here in the old stream. It kills the fish who get, you know, their heads bashed against a, a rock as, as it's making its way over to the new stream. Um, it uh, kills frogs, kills salamanders, kills, you know, whoever's caught in the flood might, might get killed. I want to put an asterisk here and go a different direction for a second and come back to this, though, because not only do they get killed by floods, but actually... Fish love floods. I don't know if you know this, but when the area floods, fish go up exploring the meadows immediately because this is a new source of food. Mm -hmm. The food that the streams get and rivers get usually is, is for the most part, 
um, stuff that flows in from the the shore. There, for the most, go ahead. Right here in our rice fields, the catfish about this big, right up in the fields. They, and how I mean, we eat right out of the field. How long does it take them to come up when it floods? Let's see. We plant, we throw out the rice in late June. The rains come within a month. I think within about two months, they're they're and they're jumping out of the fields onto the dirt road. You can just pick them up, or or you take like a little bamboo. Or the the native people will take a bamboo, um, make like a little cage, and put it over the where the where the water runs between fields, and they'll catch them there. Uh, they're little crabs. They're shrimp. All of that, you can just eat right out of the field. And yes, and my my point was that fish love floods. I, I mean, some die in the floods, but some love them because it's a new source of food. And so, um, as soon as it floods, there's fish going up into what was a meadow yesterday before it before the the water rose. Um, and then, of course, some of those get stuck. So the point is, it makes it really sad because because there are a lot of of plants and animals die in a flood, but it also makes her really happy because every time it floods, that creates new habitat. And that's what the river does. And she said, every time there's a flood, it's short-term habitat loss, long-term habitat gain. And I love that phrase for a bunch of reasons. One is it's true on its own. Another is it's true as a larger life lesson for so many of us, you know, why do so many of us stay in relationships we don't like? It's fear of habit, low short-term habitat loss for long-term habitat gain. Why do so many of us stay in jobs we don't like? Fear of short-term habitat loss for long-term habitat gain. And I often think of the courage of a river that to, to go into a new place and to, um, to face short-term habitat loss for long-term habitat gain and to fear that loss of the safety and comfort and the same with the fish going into this new place you're taking a risk when you leave the channel and go into the field and some of them it costs them their lives and some of them have a very happy time in there and anyway so those are some of the ways we misdefine rivers and uh some of the ways we oh and here's another way i want to talk about this you said sort of almost animistic and i also Okay, I'm very I'm comfortable with everything I've said so far. And I'm going to say something now that I think I believe, but but I can't defend it the way I defend everything I've said so far, which is I also perceive rivers as living beings on their own. And at the very least, if we don't like that, we can talk about rivers certainly as communities. There, there certainly are living communities of all sorts of different species. But then I also think, um, you know, so is a human being, that a human being is a community of what, 90% of the cells in your body are actually don't have your bacteria. DNA. Yeah, bacteria and everybody else who are taking nutrients and you take <laughs> in nutrients and then you expel them, you take in water and you expel it. And a river does those same things. It takes in water, it expels it, it uh, takes in food and release releases other food. And of course, our poop is food for somebody else. So it releases waste that are food for somebody else. And so at the very least, I'm comfortable saying that a river can be a metaphor for a living being of itself. But I actually do believe that rivers are living beings. And that's, you know, the, again, I don't want somebody to dismiss everything else I say because of that. But I'm glad to to stand up for for rivers as living beings of their own. Um, in your in your essay, um, you talk about this kind of thing, like you're going into how a river might feel or is, or um, this this kind of mystical kind of thing. I guess you call it. Well, it's a pretty short essay. Do you want me to just read it? Yeah, go for it. Okay, so I'll tell you the story of how how it was written first. It it it's kind of funny because it was the most beautiful thing I've ever written, and I didn't actually write it. Um, it was written by a river, by which I, a stream actually. I don't mean it was written me sitting by a stream. I, I, what I mean is that 
I went to a stream and the stream gave it to me. And there are a couple of things. One of them is that I was, I wanted to try to talk about what something is by its missable boundaries, by its mixable boundaries, as opposed to, okay, the word definition, and I like this word, the word definition means to to delimit. It, it means to, to define the limits of. So when we define the word square, we're saying this is a square, this is not a square. And if you define what is American football, this is American football, ping pong is not American football. This is not. And so you're, mm -hmm. you're making the edges. And mm -hmm. I, I was interested in how would we discuss a river if we didn't discuss it in terms of a sharp boundary? So for, there was that is, is one thing. And the other thing is I was wondering, what is it like to be a river? I wanted to, to try to to answer that as best as a human being can. Of course, it's nonsense because I can't even say what it's like to be a lane. You know, I don't know what it's <laughs> like to be you. Um, I can, I can, I can barely say what it's like to be me. Um, and so, but I wanted to try. I think it's, I think it's a worthy effort to try to understand what it's like to be someone else. And I'm, I'm trying to write this for weeks. I can't do it. I'm not getting anywhere. And then I realized that this is all pretty stupid because I live about. I don't know, 30 yards from a stream. And it's kind of stupid for me to try to write what it's like to be a river when I can just ask one. You know, it's like me trying to write what it's like to be you when I can just say, hey, Lane, what's it like to be you? You know, it's just, or I mean, imagine a relationship, you're, you're in a romantic relationship. You, 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 you try to write, what is it like to be my partner? What is it like to be you? Without actually asking them. So I realized it's pretty stupid. So I go out and I walk down to the stream and I say, so what is it like to be you? And the stream had been waiting so long for some human to ask that question because the whole piece, the whole piece came to me like that. And like, I can't tell you how instantly it's like, okay, you want to know what it's like to be me? Boom, immediately. And then I started running back into the house as fast as I could because I'd gone down there to do this not even expecting an answer. So I didn't bring pens on paper. So I run into the house. As I'm running into the house, the forest is like, hey, hello, what's it like to be a forest too? So I, I asked that question at the same time. So that's that's how this piece came to be written. And basically all I did is write it down. I hardly edited it at all. Pretend you're a river. Pretend you're the mist who falls so fine, so gentle, that nothing separates water and air. You're the rain who falls in sheets, explodes onto the ground to leave pox and puddles. You're the ground who receives this water, soaking it up, taking it in, carrying it deep inside. You're the cracks and fissures where the waters accumulate, flow, fall to join more water and more in pools and rivers who move slowly through cavities, crevices, pores. You're the sounds and silence of water seeping or staying still. You're the meeting of wet and dry the union of liquid and solid, where solids dissolve and liquids solidify. You're the pressure who pushes water through seams. You're the rushing water who bubbles from the earth. You're a tiny pool between rocks. You overflow, find your way to join others who, like you, are moving, moving. You're, you are the air at the surface of the water, the joining of substantial and insubstantial, the union of under and over, weight and not weight. You're the riffle, the rapid, the tiny waterfall who turns water to air and air to water. You're the mist who settles on the soil. You're the plants who drink the mist and you're the sun who warms and feeds them. You're the fish who feed on insects, who feed on plants, who feed on soils, who feed on fish. You're the fish who become soils, who become plants, who become insects, who become fish, who flow down the river. You are the river who joins other rivers to become a new river who's all the rivers and something else. You are the river. You do not stop at the banks where liquid turns to solid. You reach into the sky and into the soil. Water moves through rocks, comes up to form pools far from the fast flow where the rivers move together, seeps down to join still waters deep below the surface. Waters who sleep and wake and sleep and mingle with the stones who are the river too. You are the river who is married to the mountains you have known since they were young, who've given themselves to you as you've given yourself to them. 
You are the canyon you nestle into each year deeper than the year before. You are the forest who give you their fallen trees and the meadows you flood and feed and who feed you back their fruits and fine insects who fly to your surface to be taken in by the fish who with their own bodies again feed the meadows. You are the river who feeds the ocean, who feels the tides pushing and pulling against your mouth, the waves mixing fresh and salt. You are that intermingling. That's who you are. That's who you've always been. You are the river. You've lived with volcanoes and glaciers. You've been dammed by lava and ice. You carried log jams so large and so old they grow their own forests with you running beneath. You've lived through droughts and floods. You are the river. You miss the salmon. You miss the sturgeon. You miss the ocean. You miss the meadows. You miss the forest. You miss the beavers and otters and grizzly bears. You miss the human beings. You are the river. You want them back. You want to feel the tickling of the sturgeon, the thrusting of the salmon. You want to carry food and soil to the ocean. You want to cover the meadows as you used to, and you want to give yourself to them, and you want them to give themselves to you, as you've done forever and as they have too. Now, pretend you're a forest. You are the bark of trees and the hairy moss who hangs from them. You're the duff who becomes soil, who becomes trees, who becomes seeds, who becomes squirrels, who become owls, who become slugs, who become shrews, who become soil. You are the trees who cannot live without the fungi, who cannot live without the voles, who cannot live without the trees. You're the fire who cannot live without the trees, who cannot live without the woodpeckers, who cannot live without the beetles, who cannot live without the fire. You are the wind who speaks to the trees and the trees who speak to the wind. You are the birds who sing and the birds who do not. You're the salamanders, the ferns, the millipedes, the bumblebees who sleep on flowers, waiting for the morning to warm you up so you can eat and fly on home. You too have lived through drought and flood, hot and cold, and you too miss the salmon. You miss the owls, the grizzly bears, you miss the rivers, you miss the human beings. You want them all back. You need them back or you will die. Thank you for sharing that. Well, thanks for asking. Yeah, so that, I think we, I think it, one 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 thing is we, we misdefine rivers, as I said, I think we also disrespect rivers. And I mean, I don't know if we really want to go here, but the, the, the way we disrespect rivers is the way we disrespect forests and everything else in that we don't accept it as a willful being who has a life as valuable to it as yours is to you and mine is to me. But instead we look at it purely instrumentally as to how we can use it. There's a great line by a Canadian lumberman. When I look at trees, I see dollar bills. And if when you look at trees, you see dollar bills, you're going to treat them one way. And if when you look at trees, you see trees, you'll treat them another way. If when you look at this particular tree, you see this particular tree, you'll treat it differently still. And it's the same with a river. If when you look at a river, you see a place to dump your toxic waste, you'll treat it one way. And if you see mm -hmm. a river as a way to move goods from New Orleans to St. Louis, you'll, you'll treat it one way. And you'll remove the snags, for example, and you'll channelize it. And if you look at the river, if you perceive the river as the source of your life and your community, then you'll treat it differently. And if you perceive the river as a river in its own being, a river, if you, if you perceive the river as the being who, who is the source of your life. I mean, I don't think it's any coincidence that in so many ancient cosmologies, the uh, the source of life is 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 a river being. Um, Tiamat is one of the the oldest of these, and she was the uh, she represented salt water and. Uh, her consort was, um, don't remember his name, but uh, he represented uh, still water, still fresh water, so aquifers. And I, I think if you, I mean, if you, if you perceive the river as a being worthy of respect, you're going to treat it differently. And this has huge consequences. We can talk 
you know, about uh, consequences everywhere. Um, I do uh, two consequences I can just name off the top of my head. One of them is um, I knew this woman who was married to a guy from Bangladesh and he's about our age or my age. 60, I'm 62. So he's, he's about 60, say. And he, um, when he was a kid or when he was a teenager, uh, his mother would say, live, grew up in Bangladesh. His mother would say, go get us some lunch. And he would go to the river and he would bring her some lunch. And by the time he's 25 and 30, the river is so polluted that there aren't any fish anymore. And so if she says, go get some lunch, he's got to go to the grocery store and buy some fish from Iceland. And mm -hmm. so that's one way that we our disrespecting of rivers has grossly affected us. Another way is one of the reasons that Katrina, Hurricane Katrina was so terrible was, or it was so destructive, I would say, I shouldn't say terrible, it wasn't terrible, but it was destructive, um, was that they had destroyed, they, by channelizing the river, they had destroyed, and by doing everything else I'd done to it, they had destroyed a lot of the barrier islands off the coast of Louisiana. So mm -hmm. when a hurricane would come in, it would break a lot of itself on those islands. A lot of the force would be gone, and they're not there anymore as a buffer. And that's one reason that the flooding was so severe. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, hoist on our own petard by we disrespect the rivers. And and what is it, 25% of rivers in the world no longer reach the ocean? Um, I mean, how the, many the, the ways we disrespect rivers is manifest. How many dams are in the U.S. or around the world? Do you know the numbers? I don't know the numbers for the world. I know in the United States there are 2 million dams. And there are, a lot of those are tiny. There are 2 million dams. There are 60,000 dams over 13 feet tall, but 13 feet is a weird number. So what that is, two meters. Two meters. There are uh, 60,000 dams over two meters tall, 70,000 dams over one meter tall. No, 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 sorry. I got that wrong. Four meters tall and two meters tall. One meter is like three and a half feet. So mm -hmm. it's, so I got to say this correctly, 60,000 dams over four meters tall. I'm confusing myself. 60,000 dams. Anyway, there's 60, yeah. 60, 60 to 70,000 dams over like 14 feet tall, 15 feet tall, somewhere right. in there. And the, the point is that that's a lot of dams. You know, I, I, we're running out of time, but but I do want to say one thing about dams, which is I was talking to some fisheries biologists about dams, and they said, look, the problem isn't a dam on a river because rivers actually get blocked all the time. They get blocked by lava flows. They get blocked by mudslides. They get, they get blocked. The problem is when you've got 2 million dams in the United States and you've got X million dams all over the world, the problem is not one landslide blocking a river for you know three months until it pushes through. Um, the problem is every river, almost every river in the world. I live 20 miles from the longest river in the United States that's not dammed, and it's not that long. It's, I don't know, 120 miles or something. Um, mm -hmm. And it's th there are very few rivers undammed, and that's the problem. Um, and I'm not saying that it's okay to put in dams, I'm saying that it's terrible to put in millions of dams and they're going in. I don't know the numbers on how quickly they're going in, but they're still continuing. Even though we know the harm caused by dams, they're continuing to be put them in. There's, there's a big one, a big one that's planned for the, the Nile. Um, there's a bunch of big ones already on the Nile, but there's a new big one. That's planned for. Um, well, I'm there's not a, there's sure. a yeah, I don't remember where it is. I just know that I read something the other day about, yet again, they're going to cut off. I don't understand how people don't understand at this point. I mean, in the, like, I don't know what year it was, Robert the Bruce, whenever he was around, he made it a law that said that if you if you dam streams, you have to make salmon passage. And this is, I mean, how long ago is that? It's 400 years, 300 years, 500 years? Right. Long time ago. It's, we don't have an excuse. You know, I think that one thing that's interesting when we look back at um, what we call bioregionalism today, which 
you have a good, you, you say it very nicely, the river's married to the mountains. That's bioregionalism. We go back and look in history. I mean, I was just looking at Plato. They have the interlinear Greek with the with, 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 translated into English. He's talking about deforestation. Mencius, deforestation. We're going thousands of years back here, you know. So when the we talk about this today, me. yeah, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. When we talk about this today, we, people look at us, I guess. The problem is not information. It's never been information. We, it doesn't take a, a cognitive giant to figure out that if you deforest a hillside, that that's going to have effects. And it's, I don't remember who said this, but basically I, I say a version of this, but somebody said it before me, certainly forest proceedus and deserts dog our heels. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's what this culture does is deforest. And, and I mean, for God's sake, the, um, you know, Troy, uh, they found the site and it's not on the, it's not on the water. It's like 12 miles from the water at this point because of, because of the effects of various deforestation and then the destruction of, of, of river systems. Yeah, it's all it's all there in history, isn't it? Yeah, it is, and it's all there before our eyes when we look outside. I mean, you don't and to, and ask old people, you know, what was the river like? I mean, it doesn't even it doesn't have to be old people in your mm -hmm. region. Um, you know, Mekong River catfish have just been hammered in the last thirty years. Yeah, we've talked about this, and those are huge fish. Just that there are so many dams in the world. Oh, and we should know better. They've known forever. And I mean, dams kill rivers. That's that's really all there is to it. Um, so rivers today would be more like canals rather than rivers. Well, they're canals or they're reservoirs. Um, or reservoirs. Like, for example, and this, this causes problems on, again, every level. One of the levels, as well as stopping fish migration up, um, also, um, for example, salmon have a certain amount of time before they switch from freshwater fish to saltwater fish. And they are used to, they evolved being carried down the river. And now, A, they have to swim. And B, um, it takes a lot longer because the river is not flowing very fast. And C, there are a lot of introduced species who live in the slower moving water who eat them. D, when they go over the, the, when they go through the turbines or over the, the spillways, they can die from the sudden change of pressure. And I mean, so it's just, it's hammering them. They, we talk a lot and people understand the difficulty that fish have going up and they can't go up past uh, dams. Um, but they don't often think about how it has changed the river on the way down. Another way it changes rivers is that the ones that are used for hydroelectricity will often have changes that are fairly rapid. And that's not how rivers evolved. Rivers evolved with regular, um, you know, the, the, the floods might come in the spring. You're not going to get a change in, in uh, water height in September. And... Mm -hmm. This will have huge effects on, for example, the raising of insects, because the insects might uh, be used to laying their eggs at a certain time. But if the water fluctuates rapidly over that time, they dry out and or they they get inundated. You know, it's 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 this is messing with natural cycles who have evolved with each other for in cases, in some cases, hundreds or tens of millions of years. And. You mentioned the the catfish, the, the Mekong catfish. Can you talk a little bit about those related to, say, the dams? Because these these catfish are what uh, four hundred pounds, you know, um, huge fish. They they were even until fairly recently Over. one of the largest uh, by weight, one of the largest migrations on the planet because there were so many of them and they're so big, and they migrate up to spawn and then back down to live to, to the rest of the time and um 
a number have a number of dams. This is the, the, one of the things that's extraordinary about this is this happens so quickly that China put in a number of dams in the um, since the '90s. So basically, the last thirty years that have um, absolutely devastated the Mekong catfish populations. And I mean, you you live in the region, so you would know better than I. But all I know is I've done a couple interviews about it because it's it's heartbreaking and it's it's not something we can blame on those stupid people a long time ago even though like we said people have understood that dams kill anadromous or not just anadromous fish but dams kill fish they've known that for forever um anyway so that's been just devastating i've done i've done a couple interviews about that and then the salmon uh, i had read an article by <clears throat> a woman who went to the Columbia River with her son, I think it was, but it's one of the major salmon uh, migrations. And they talk about just the salmon were so thick, you could almost walk on, walk across the river on these fish, you know? Yeah, she actually went up to Alaska because, or Canada, because the Columbia is trashed. The Columbia salmon runs are, are very bad, very poor. And um yeah there i've seen photos of some streams up in canada or in alaska that you look at the you look at the it's it's like it'll be a river i don't know let's say 15 20 meters across and maybe a meter deep and um the uh at first it looks like well, it's what's what's so great about this. There's a little bit of yellow at the side, and then in the middle is a is dark. You can see a dark bottom. And then you look more closely. And the reason it's a dark bottom is because it's fish. The entire river is full of fish. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to people in this region, the, the fish have been hammered in this region, but I've talked to people before who who old timers here who say in the 50s and 60s, when they were, I guess I'm an old timer then, because they were growing up in the 50s and 60s. But people growing up in the 50s and 60s who remember hearing salmon runs for miles before you could see them. And I've read accounts from 100 years ago or 150 years ago of runs of salmon um, that would keep you awake at night with the slapping of their tails against the water. And I've also read accounts of runs that and this is this is sort of post aircraft era. So I don't I don't know when, but I know it's post 1950 where they were able to take pictures from above and they could see and they could see the basically the run of salmon went like 10 and 12 miles out to the ocean waiting to come in and mm -hmm. and i mean they're in this region they're gone I, I i have seen salmon spawning here and i see like three fish i don't see you know this the bottom not covered with fish and and what i've been saying for a long time is I think that salmon, salmon are so resilient that if this culture stops killing rivers by 2025, I've been saying for 20 years, that they'll be fine. But, you know, we're coming up quickly on 2025. I don't know how much more they can take. And it's not the, just them. I mean, the same, the same is true for rivers all over the world. I mean, what are you going to do? How are the fish going to survive if the river no longer even reaches the ocean? And I, I interviewed somebody a few years ago that I didn't I didn't ever play this interview because I was so disappointed with it that the person we were talking about the Rio Grande in the United States. And she said she kept emphasizing one of the things I want to make sure everybody understands is there's enough there's enough water for everybody. And I, there's not the Rio Grande never no longer reaches the ocean all year. And. If there was enough water for everybody, there would be the fish wouldn't be dying, would they? But the fish are dying because there's not enough water. And it's because it's being taken out. It's crazy how I don't know. I don't know anything about non-industrialized nations. I don't know anything about where you live, how water is allocated. But in the Western United States, okay, the Colorado River has more than 100 percent of its water allocated for use. Mm hmm. I mean, who, who so come up with this? So and did that, the that, town. So did the town in Maui. You had to have permits to use water, which led to well the incineration of the entire town. Yeah, it's 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 completely nuts. The the, the rivers today in China, 
if I say to you, they're all polluted and some are too toxic to touch, how does that make you feel? This way of life can't end soon enough. And I think every being on the planet, except for humans, and probably there are a lot of humans who would go along this, can't wait for it to end. Because there's, I said earlier that forests precede us since deserts dog our heels. If your way of life is based on systematically destroying the planet, that you upon which you depend for your life that's not a plan with a the future there are there are people who sometimes say to me gosh derek you must not like humans very much because you're against this way of life it's like i'm not the one who is condemning future humans to hell on earth there are not, not, just, not just future pakistan was 70 or 30 percent of the water last year more than that yeah yeah and and these are predictable these are predictable when you deforest this is what happens when you change the climate it's going to change in ways that surprise and dismay you and part of the problem is that if your experience not your mind not your heart but if your experience as your food comes from a grocery store and your water comes from a tap, you will defend to the death the system that brings those to you because your your life depends on it. If, on the other hand, your food comes from a river and your or from a land base, and your water comes from a river, you will defend to the death those because your life depends on it. But one of the things that's happened is for most of us, I'm not talking about the people who live near you with the 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 fields where you can grab catfish who come out of the the, the river. But for most of us, we have systematically been had we the, the system has interposed itself between us and the living planet. So this is how it ends up being, gosh, what a difficult question. Do we dam this river so that we can make more electronic stuff? And it starts with with food and water, and then it ends up with uh, there's a this is this is not going to be well i'll just say it there's a a doobie brothers album from the 1970s called um what were once vices are now habits and that applies to us with our luxuries that's that awful what were right. once luxuries are now habits and right they you know people i i, I read um i read an account by carl jung about how much he hated telephones. And that there was such an intrusion because somebody can just call you anytime, day or night, and interrupt your thinking and interrupt your solitude and how that's terrible. And now there was a uh, a uh, a survey done of 18 to 25 year olds in the UK like a couple of years ago. And a significant portion of them, like 20%, if they had a choice between losing a finger and losing their cell phone, they would lose a finger. Mm. And a significant portion of them check their cell phones when they're taking a shower and they check their cell phones during sex. And if given a choice between losing, if, if there's a fire in their home and they have a choice between grabbing their pet cat or their cell phone, they'll grab their cell phone. And that's how, how much, I mean, I don't really, we don't have time to get into the whole Lewis Mumford authoritarian technica th thing again, but that's the system is is in charge and it is running amok all over the planet. And so when I hear that the water is too toxic to touch, first, I feel terrible for those creatures who used to live in it and that was their home. And I feel terrible for those creatures and for those humans and non-humans who depended on it for their lives. And, and I think this is, I think this is blasphemy. You know, that's, that's a word that, that we don't generally like to use because it's been used to, you know, burn heretics against, against, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the church or something. But I think, uh, 
hold on. I want to look something up real quick. This will, this will take just a moment. You mean blasphemy against uh, Spinoza? I, I well, what I'm saying is that it is it is obscene. It is yes. It is destroying the sacred to destroy a river. And uh, I want to find. Um, Okay, sacred comes from a root meaning to make holy. Holy comes from a root meaning that which must be preserved whole or intact, that cannot be transgressed or violated, and is connected to an old high German word for health, happiness, and good luck. I'm going to say that again. Sacred comes from a root meaning to make holy. Holy comes from a root meaning that which must be preserved whole or intact that cannot be transgressed or violated and is connected to an old high German word for health, happiness, and good luck. And part of the problem is that we think that, you know, a book written a thousand years ago is holy, is a holy text, but the living river right there is not holy and or i mean I, I don't want to get into the whole thing about you know the indians consider the ganges holy but i mean they're polluting the hell out of it so do they really feel that it must not be transgressed and i i think that we i mean we can we can get all highfalutin and say yes that rivers we must remember how sacred rivers are or we can also just say we have to remember that they're the source of life Thank you so much, Derek, for your time and Thanks. speaking. I've been speaking with Derek Jensen, eco-philosopher on the poetics of rivers.